are you ready to worship the king are you ready to worship the king this is Palm Sunday come on put your hands together
Darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring. When you walk into the room, every heart starts burning. And nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship.
nobody like you, Lord. There's nobody like you, Lord. And when you walk into the room, everything changes. Jesus. 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 We love you. Jesus. 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 We love you. will pass away but there's something about the name of Jesus there's something about the king of kings there's something about Jesus name above all other names name above all other gods he is the great I am Lord we thank you this morning that we can come and celebrate Palm Sunday God. 
We thank you that you took that road, the Via Doloroso, the road of suffering. God, we thank you this morning, oh God, that you walked that path for us. We thank you, Jesus. We celebrate you, King. We celebrate you alone, King. You are worthy to be praised this morning, oh God. We love you, oh God. Lord, we love you. We love you, we love you, we love you. Can we just say, Lord, I love you. I love you, God. Lord, we love you this morning. God, we thank you just for being who you are. For being the great I am. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. No one before you. No one behind you. You're everything, oh God. You're everything, oh God. Lord, help us grasp that this morning, Father God. That no matter what we're dealing with, that you're everything, oh God. You're all that we need, oh God. When you've got nothing else, you've got Jesus and you've got enough to start again. I just hear God saying that. When all you've got left is Jesus, you've got enough to start again. I don't know what you're facing, but all you need is Jesus. All you need is Jesus. All you need is Jesus. 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 You know, in the Old Testament, they had names that, that recognized the different characters of God. Jehovah Shalom, peace. Jehovah Rapha, healer. Jehovah Sikhanu. Jehovah Jireh. When you say the name of Jesus, you're saying all of that in one. When you just say Yeshua, when you say Jesus, you're saying Jehovah Jireh. You're saying Jehovah Shalom. You're saying my provider, my peace, my healing. Just call on Jesus. That's all you need. That's all you need is Jesus. Father God, we thank you for what you're about to do in this service, oh God. If you're here in-house or watching at home, it doesn't matter. God is right there with you. Jesus is right, sitting right there next to you. And he's going to touch you today if you would just enter in and receive it. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this service. We give you glory, praise, and honor in Jesus' name. Are you excited about giving right now? Amen. Are you excited about giving? Come on. Well, every week you hear encouraging words, and, and what I just want to say is thank you. I want to say thank you. As your pastor, you all have been so faithful uh, in your giving, in your generosity. I tell you, you know, we've been through and we're still in a pandemic and, and uh, there's been a lot of things that have taken place in the lives of people and businesses and churches. And, and uh, I just want to say because of you and your consistency and your obedience, amen, we haven't skipped a beat. We haven't missed a beat. Amen. We're meeting budget every month and, and we are very, very blessed. We're still giving away to missions and, and benevolence and, and touching our community. And matter of fact, uh, you'll hear in the weeks to come, Pastor Laura and her team are uh, going to uh, give us a glimpse into some of the other things we're going to start doing here soon with our outreach ministry. You know, we do our backpack uh, giveaways every year. We also do um, 
Christmas, and but there's some other things we're getting ready to do, even for outreach that I am so excited about, and Pastor Laura and her team are excited as well. And so guess what? We are doing what God has called us to do as a church, amen? And uh, we could not do this without you. So thank you all for, you know, uh, we used to say thank you all for our online givers. Now main, mainly everybody's an online giver. So uh, thank you, we all those that give during the week as well. Uh, we appreciate you. Your generosity. Amen. That's all I got. Hey, man, I just want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's say uh, our, well, there's several ways to give. Uh, you can tell that uh, we have several ways there. And so thank you for your, uh, again, your faithfulness in that. Well, let's read our, our confession. All right. Are y'all excited on Palm Sunday or what? I am. I don't know what it, I mean, it, my, my basketball team even lost last night, but I'm still excited about Jesus. ORU, y'all saw the game. That was my, my, the last shot, came down to the last shot. If we just would have prayed a little bit more, amen. But anyway, let's read this together. Ready? God is my source of all blessing in heaven and earth. God's will is that I am blessed beyond all measure and beyond my expectations. He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all I'm able to ask or think. Giving is an act of my faith, and I cheerfully give back to God what he has given me. As I trust God with my tithes and offerings, I trust that God will bless the works of my hands. In Jesus' name, and we all said, amen. God bless you. Let me hear you make some Holy Ghost crazy noise right now. Let me hear you. These are our announcements today for March 28th, 2021. Uh, many of our announcements you can find uh, online on, on our GroupMe app. Uh, so if you're not on GroupMe, please email us at info at livefreechurch.org, and we would be happy to get you plugged in to the different GroupMe's, uh, and it'll be a blessing to you as you're able to connect in that way. Uh, I want to start by giving a shout out to Teen Life. Teen Life, you are awesome and amazing, and my beautiful wife did an exceptional job uh, this past Friday. Uh, we were able to really plug in and, and dig into God's word on uh, this, what we call Palm Sunday, and going back to when they were yelling and, and, and cheering at the top of their lungs, Hosanna, you know, and it, it really made me think it took me back to just remembering how great our God is, right? Hosanna, and, and there's so many meanings behind it, uh, help and, and rescue and Savior, and it just brought me back to, man, you know, help me, Lord, when I'm crying out, Hosanna, I'm crying out, Lord, help me. You know, he is a very present help in the time of trouble. He's the rescue when you don't know which way to turn. He is the one who saved me when I thought that there was no hope. So, Hosanna in the highest. We worship him today. So, shout out to you, Teen Life. That was a great time in God's word. Live Free Kids will be happening tonight by Zoom, 5 p.m. with Pastor Cheryl Full. So get excited, young people. There's going to be an awesome time in the Lord with Pastor Cheryl. Uh, and that will be again at 5 p.m. today. Uh, Bible study. We'll be having Bible study in the, the studying in the book of Proverbs on Tuesday, March 30th, and Thursday, April 1st. And that's at 7 a.m. in the morning. Pastor Terrell will be teaching from the book of Proverbs. So get excited about that. Wake up early and then live out the rest of your day blessed. Amen. Strong Life. We are going to be getting together for Strong Life. Strong Life, men, where are you? All right, all right, all right. You're not here, apparently, because that wasn't loud enough. Strong Life Online, where are you at? Where are you at? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Amen. My online brothers are there. This Saturday, April 3rd, 7.30 a.m., we will be having our Strong Life meeting. Please join us via Zoom. Uh, Lee Cookman, who you just saw, Brother Lee, will be bringing the word uh, on that day. So we are excited about that. Amen. Praise God. Easter Sunday. You want to take Easter Sunday? You got to be ready. No, you got to be ready. You're not ready. 
Give me the mic. <laughs> Easter Sunday. Woo! Resurrection Sunday is next Sunday, April 4th. If you would like to join us, please, please, please register on the website because we are still practicing social distancing. So we want to make sure that we have enough space, that we arrange the chairs properly for everybody to come. So just go ahead online at livefreechurch.org and we'll be able to get you registered. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Register before Friday. Yes. Please do not wait till Sunday morning to register for Easter. <laughs> We hate to turn you away, but if there's not enough room, it's going to be sorry. So first come, first serve. Um, also, on Easter Sunday, we're going to have Live Free Kids service in person. Woo! So during the service, we will have Live Free Kids in person. And from now on, it will be starting on the first Sunday of each month, we'll have Live Free Kids service in person. So yay! All right, the Live Free Church app. Please go ahead and download it. I mean, how many times do you have to tell you? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Okay, no, Live Free Church app, please. There's lots of great information on there. It's easy to, to find what's the announcements, what's happening, all the events that are going on, streaming service, so you can take it wherever you go. So please go ahead and download the Live Free Church app. Um, hey, also subscribe to our YouTube channel at Live Free Church GA. Like and subscribe. Instagram, that's Live Free Church GA. Like us on Facebook at Live Free Church. And again, the App Store has Live Free Church. Awesome? Yay! <laughs> I did it! <laughs> Praise God. As we get ready for his word today, uh, stay excited about what God is doing. He's doing great things here in the life of this body of believers at Live Free Church. And so without further ado, coming to us now with the word, our pastor, Pastor Terrell Taylor. As dawn broke, he arose. Jesus was coming for his kingdom coming to save man from sin, coming to crush the hold of death from within, coming so man could live with him forever. But man's heart did not desire his saving grace. He came humbly on the unbroken foal of a donkey. As he entered the city, the people rejoiced, but Jesus wept. You see, the crowds didn't want forgiveness and mercy. They desired an earthly victory. They followed Jesus for misguided reasons. They followed his works, but denied the freedom in his words. He came for a spiritual kingdom, not of earth, but the kingdom of heaven. And though legions of angels knelt before him, he did not come to wage war on the Romans, but to wage war on religion, that cancerous hypocrisy driven by pride, which concluded that the sinner should be shamed and excluded. But these very sinners were the purpose of his crucifixion. Make no mistake, Jesus did not die a victim. He was instead the willing sacrifice for our sin. We worship Jesus today not because of what he may do for us, but because of who he is to us, our King, our Messiah, and our God, who brought his kingdom through a cross, the heavy cross that pointed to a promise, a revelation that one day will stand with every nation, tribe, and language. Palm branches lifted high, one voice united in a deafening cry, salvation belongs to our God. Jesus is here. His kingdom is here. Let's give him a shout of praise, Hosanna. His kingdom is here. Let's pray. God, we thank you, our Father, for this day. We thank you 
that this is the day that you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Because of you, we rejoice even in the face of current trials that we are experiencing. We rejoice today as we gather together in this house and online because of our love for you and your love for us and our love for each other. We thank you, God. We thank you for being with each of us this morning, uh, just as close today as you always are. Pour out your spirit, Lord, on this service. Pour out your spirit on our lives, on our homes, on our families, God, during these difficult days. And give us the boldness we need to be the light in the darkness, pointing others to you. In Jesus' name, we pray, and we all said amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. I'm glad you're with us here on on this Palm Sunday. And I want you to take a look at this picture here. And it says there, if you can see that, it says, Jacob the stutterer told me it was Palm Palm Sunday. Can you see the guy in the pom poms? All right. Anyway, spring. All right. Well, I'm glad no one came with pom-poms. If you're online, you probably can see that a little better, right? <laughs> well, today is Palm Sunday. And today I'm going to be talking about who is this. Everybody say, who is this? Come on, say it like you mean it. Who? Amen. Well, Palm Sunday is the day we celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem one week before his resurrection. And as Jesus entered the holy city, he neared uh, the culmination of a long journey toward Golgotha. He had, to, he had come to save the lost. And now was the time. This was the place to secure our salvation, my salvation, and your salvation. And Palm Sunday marked the start of what is often called Passion Week, the final seven days of Jesus' earthly ministry. Now, Palm Sunday was the beginning of the end of Jesus' work on the earth. We're going to look at the place, the person, and the purpose. Turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 21 and verse 1. And uh, we have it also on the screen for your convenience. But turn with me to Matthew 21 and verse 1. And this says this, as they approached where? Jerusalem. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. And I want to start, I want to uh, uh, end there for just a moment. Where was the place, right? Well, the place he was going to was Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is by far the most renowned city in uh, the ancient uh, East. Now, Jerusalem is best known as the holy city. It's sacred to three most known, the three most well-known monolithic uh, religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So Jerusalem is an important city even now in our day. And so Jerusalem is the chief city of ancient Palestine and of the modern state uh, of Jerusalem. I was able to visit there a few years ago, and it's a beautiful, a beautiful city. Now, the name Jerusalem, pronounced Yerushalam in Hebrew, is a combination of two words, okay? Jerusalem, the first meaning Yeru, which means to flow. Some of you might want a biblical name for your next child, Yeru. I like that. It means to flow, okay? Yeru. This word has several applications such as the flowing uh, of water in a river. It, I hear the rain going on right there. That's Yeru right there. <laughs> it's flowing. It's pouring down, right? But it means water in a river. The throwing of something as being flown out of the hand or, or flowing through uh, the fingers. And so the, the, the word Jerusalem, Yeru, means to flow. And this last use uh, is in, in the... In in the name Jerusalem, the next part of the name is Shalayim. And it's from the word Shalom or Shalom, okay? Where we get the word Shalom or peace in Hebrew. So you put the words together and you get what? Flowing peace. That's what Jerusalem means. He was going to this city, appointing the way to our completeness. How many know that Jesus is the one who completes us? Amen. 
So Jerusalem, he was on his way. Now, if you, if you look in your Bible and, and you do a study on this city, the Jerusalem has many, many names throughout Scripture, such as Jabus, uh, Zion, the city of David, Salem, city of God, the city of the great king, city of Judah, the joy of the whole earth, the throne of the Lord, and it is also known as the holy city. I mean, have you ever uh, known a city to have so many names? We just call Atlanta Hot Atlanta or Atlanta. There's only two names for our city. <laughs> but Jerusalem has all these names. The city of the great king, the joy of the whole earth, the throne of the Lord. And so as they approached Jerusalem, as Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage on their way. Now, Bethphage was the name of a village one mile from Jerusalem. It means house of the early figs or house of the upright, uh, unripe figs. So to sit under one's tree uh, on one's own fig tree became a well-known expression among the Jews. So here we have a city meaning unripe figs. And in the scripture, if you had your own tree and your own figs, it became a colloquialism of the day and, and Jews would say listen if you have your own fig tree and you're sitting under guess what that represents peace and prosperity in your life did you get that having your own tree having your own fig tree hanging out with you you had peace and prosperity and so Jesus he, he stops here in the city and as his disciples they are approaching Jerusalem when when they're on their way they have this beautiful panoramic view of the city i saw it myself it is beautiful and, 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 and so they're coming through the city, and they're on the Mount of Olives, which was, by the way, the leading city of the Messianic entry. Mount of Olives, not the leading city, but the leading way for, for the Messianic uh, people who believed that they were Messiah would come from. It was their entryway into the city, the Mount of Olives. And so it was a two and a half mile long mountain ridge that towers over the eastern side of Jerusalem. Now the Mount of Olives was heavily covered. I know I'm giving you a little bit of background, but I am going somewhere with this, right? So, so the, uh, uh, the olive grove or the Mount of Olives was heavily covered with olive trees. It provided also a lookout base, a signaling uh, point, uh, the signaling point for armies defending Jerusalem. So this city has been conquered time and time and time again. And so the Mount of Olives is a point to where uh, people who, who they could see the enemy coming from far away. And so when you put these three places together, Jesus on his way to Jerusalem through Bethpage, amen, on the Mount of Olives, guess what? You get a prophetic insight about what is going on. Jesus is the way to completeness because he is, he is right to provide lasting peace and prosperity, right? Remember, the, 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 the fig tree represents peace and prosperity, but man's attempts at peace and prosperity, lasting peace and prosperity, have always failed. So here you have the king, the Messiah coming. He's saying, listen, I am the way to completeness. I am your lasting peace. Come on, somebody. He is saying, I am the anointed Messiah coming through the Mount of Olives to destroy every yoke of bondage. Did you get that, family? Amen. He is the way to completeness. He is the one that brings lasting peace and hope. The Bible even tells us that when men say there is peace and peace, then sudden destruction is going to come. Man has always uh, the desire to, to, to have peace and lasting peace. But it's only Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, that is able to bring it, and he's going to bring it even more. Come on. It was phase one right now, but phase two is coming, somebody. Amen. Somebody should give him a shout of praise right there. I said phase two is coming. So we continue. Let's look at this verse again, 21 and 1, and we're going to look at who the person is. So it says, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, what? Jesus sent two disciples. Who are we talking about? Jesus. 
He is Yeshua HaMashiach. He is Jesus the Messiah. He is Christ. He is the anointed one. Jesus was the perfect man. Different from any other man, not once during his earthly life did he sin against God or did he sin against man. Ever since Adam and Eve disobeyed God, every human has been born a sinner. Although Jesus was fully human, he didn't inherit Adam's sin nature and guilt because why? Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and he was born of a virgin. He did not have the DNA of his earthly father. <laughs> he had the DNA of his heavenly father. Aren't you glad that he represented the heavenly father? Come on. He had daddy's DNA, Abba, Father, hallelujah. And so Jesus was not only a perfect man, and you've got to understand that if you don't believe what the scripture says about Jesus, well, then you, you're, I, I'm, I'm going to pray for you. Because there's people who believed in Thor. There's people who believe in Captain America. There's people who believe in, come on, Iron Man. Come on, I'm believing in the perfect man, not Iron Man. Well, pastor, that's just a movie. That's just a, no, but I'm talking about all through the centuries. They had all kind of gods people would worship. Thor and Thor's daddy and Thor's nephew and Thor's sister, whose cousin hated the, the grandson of the uncle's brother. Y'all got that. Yeah, I got that. I know. So. No, but Jesus is the perfect man. And not only was he a perfect man, but Jesus was the miracle worker. Somebody say he's a miracle worker. Because when he walks into the room, come on. He did miracles to show the power of God and to testify to his messiahship. His miracle showed compassion for the sick, care for the hungry, power over nature, authority over demons, and triumph over sin and death. He calmed the storms, cast out demons, healed the sick. He fed thousands and raised the dead to life. Aren't you glad that we still have a miracle worker today? Hallelujah. And so Jesus is the perfect man. He's a miracle worker. And he was also the teacher who taught his disciples how to pray, whom to fear, how to give, how to fast, how to recognize people by their fruit, how repentance is better than self-righteousness. And Jesus taught us how to lose one's life in order to save it. See, I'm leading you up to somewhere. He, this is who he was as he's walking to Jerusalem. He's the perfect man. He's the miracle worker. He's the teacher. And he's also the prophet. Jesus was the prophet who spoke for God. He foretold and predicted future events and fulfilled the prophecy that God had told Moses in Deuteronomy 8 and 18. God said to Moses, there's coming a prophet hey, like you who I'm going to put my words in and he is going to speak what I command him. Guess what? Jesus fulfilled not only that prophecy, but scholars believe he fulfilled more than 300 prophecies. Just in the time that he was on the earth in the 33 years, there's still some prophecies, prophecies to be fulfilled. But can you imagine over 300 prophecies he fulfilled in his life? He was a prophet. Someday, amen, he is coming again. And he, so he, he fulfilled these requirements in the title, in word, and in deed. And so let's continue looking at verses now one through three. So here's the perfect man, the prophet. Here's the miracle worker and the teacher approaching Jerusalem. And it says, he sent two disciples, verse two, saying to them what? Go to the village ahead of you. And at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say the Lord what? Needs them. And he will send them right away. So here we see the place and we, we've talked about the person. But what was the purpose? 
Jesus sent two of his disciples to a village ahead of him, what? For a mission. How many know that we serve a God who has a mission for his son? He has a mission for you. He has a mission for me. Amen. And so Jesus has sent these disciples ahead on a mission. And, and their mission was to find a, a female donkey and her colt. A colt is a young male donkey, which is less than four years of age. Now, here in Matthew, Matthew is the only one who writes about a, a, a mother and her son. The rest of the Gospels just concentrate on the son. But here Matthew shows us that there was a mother donkey and a son donkey, all right? And, and so they go in on this mission to find. And so Jesus sent them. And guess what? Jesus sent them with no explanation. <laughs> He didn't tell him what it was for. He just said, go. And so sometimes all we have to do is be obedient to the Lord's sending. Amen? Sometimes we want to ask all the questions and, well, why God and why this and why? Sometimes you just need to go as he sends you. Come on, somebody. I know that's what happened for the Cookman family. Amen? Praise God. Sometimes you just got to go. As he sends you because the Lord has some needs. And, and it says the Lord has need of them. And so sometimes, again, in life, as disciples, we are trying to figure out what is going on. We're trying to figure out our next move. We're trying to figure out the answer to the reason we have been sent. But God sometimes won't let us know. We think it's a mission impossible, but with Jesus, all missions are possible. How many like those Mission Impossible movies? I love that. Sometimes I just think I'm Tom Cruise. I just find myself in the movie. Ah. Love those movies. But see, sometimes when the enemy says your mission is impossible, God, hallelujah, he's going to define it enough for it to be possible. But it's only possible through him. Amen. So Jesus, I want to remind us as disciples, as the family this morning, Jesus is the Lord over our mission. Don't ever confuse who is over the mission. It is not you. It is not me. It is the Lord who sends us on purpose. It is the Lord who sends us on assignment. It is the Lord who sends us on a mission. Somebody say, Jesus is Lord over the mission that's who he is he's the lord over the mission and so we've talked about now the place and and, and the purpose and, and and the person well let's continue on in the passage and in verse four we're gonna see uh, uh something in, amazing here verse four and five in, in that same chapter of matthew 21 it says this all this took place what to fulfill what was spoken through who the prophet what prophet is that? We're going to find out in just a moment. But this prophet says this in verse 5. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foil of a donkey. So what was the scriptures that, that Matthew was relating to? Who was the prophet that he was talking about? Well, it was Zechariah. In Zechariah 9, verses 9 through 10, we see that because of Jesus, his obedience to his father, he fulfilled not only this prophecy, but over 300. It says this in Zechariah 9 and 10, rejoice. Somebody say rejoice. Listen, we got too many sad Christians running around. Some of y'all, instead of taking grape juice for communion, you take lemon juice. You're sad and you're depressed. Listen, you have a king. The Bible says re what? Rejoice. Revisit the joy of your salvation. Hallelujah. So listen, the prophet is saying rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. That's another name for Jerusalem. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, what? Righteous and victorious, lowly, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foil of a donkey. 
Verse 10, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. He will rule with, uh, his rule will extend from sea to sea and from river to the ends of what? Woo, somebody should be excited about Jesus this morning. He is our king. Now, when did this prophecy take place? Some 450, 500 to 450 years prior to his arrival. If somebody gave a prophecy about you today, that would be back in what? 19, 18, 16, 15, 21. <laughs> Can you imagine that, Brother Gus, somebody prophesying about you back then? There's going to be this anointed bald head man that is going to just, oh. <laughs> But can you imagine this prophecy being fulfilled and it was spoken 400 to 500 years prior to? Man, that's awesome. Jesus, his arrival in Jerusalem. So the prophet Zechariah had prophesied this event, and now we call it Palm Sunday. And the important point in the prophecy is that we just read, the king is meek. The king is humble. When the prophet says that he comes riding on a donkey, he is contrasting him with the chariot the war horse, and the battle bull. We read that in verse 10. Jesus is contrasted to the chariot, the war horse, and the battle bull. And, and, and this is the fact that this king is a man of peace. That, that is very important that we understand this. It's very distinctive. In ancient times, and I want you to hear this, in ancient times, listen, in ancient times, the fact that the king is a man of peace is important because in, in ancient times, a king would normally enter his capital riding what? He would not normally enter the capital riding on a donkey. That's not what kings did. Kings would ride into the city proudly. <laughs> On a war horse, or perhaps he would march in at the head of troops. You know, a donkey was the animal for a man of peace. It would be used by a priest or a merchant or a well-known citizen, perhaps, but not a king. Not a king. And so Jesus is coming on this donkey and the donkey Jesus rode was specifically called a beast of burden. It was a lowly animal. A king on a donkey was almost a contradiction in terms. How many would rather your king come in on a nice horse? Not some little donkey that looked like Shrek, the donkey in Shrek. We don't want that. So it was a contradiction in terms. A king, really, coming on a donkey? So when Jesus rode into the city, and the way he did was a significant affirmation of his character and his purpose. Jesus viewed himself as the king of peace. But he did not interpret messianic kingship as the most, uh, as a lot of his contemporaries did. You saw in that video, he didn't come to overthrow the Roman government. That's what the zealots wanted. And that's what people, amen, who was expecting the Messiah, that's what they wanted. But he did not view his messianic uh, messiahship in terms of overcoming armies and battles and doing conquests. No, he saw him in his way of peace. He came in peace and love and compassion. So let's continue the narrative in the text in verse 6 and verse 7. It says this, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. So what did the servants do? What did his disciples do? The disciples did as they had been ordered and instructed to do. They went off and got the donkey. Matthew includes both the animals in this passage, while the other gospels, again, only mention one colt. 
Uh, but, but Matthew sees a literal fulfillment of prophecy, which speaks of a donkey and also of a colt. It seems likely that the prophet was speaking of one animal, but refers to it twice. And it, and it has varying descriptions in, in certain passages. But Matthew doesn't mean that Jesus sat on two animals. See, sometimes people will say, well, the Bible is contradicted. No, no, the word is not contradicted of itself. You just got to study, that's all. And so here we see there there are two animals, and they place their cloaks on them, but Jesus only rode the colt. Basically, the mama had to be there so the colt wouldn't get too scared, all right? Isn't that something, though? Jesus is fulfilling this prophecy. And Mark tells us that this colt had never, ever been written. And Matthew again shows us how even the mother is walking along its side to help it calm itself. So here Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is now riding this peaceful uh, uh, animal, this colt that had never been risen, uh, never been ridden before. Isn't that a contradictory in terms? How many know that life can be contradictory? <laughs> Jesus says to lose your life. What? In order to save it. Jesus says, give so you can what? Have more. Jesus says, listen, uh, don't be in pride, but walk in lowliness. Come on, in humility. Come on, Jesus says what? Love your enemy. Woo, that's a contradictory in terms. Sometimes I just want to go with blows with my enemies. I have a new word in my vocabulary. I, it, it's idiot. Ever since I turned 50, this word just has sprung up in my spirit. Because I don't have time to debate. I just say they're idiots. Not you. I'm talking about the, those folks out, out there, amen, who's coming up with all these different ways to do whatever they think is right. But listen, let me tell you, Jesus, amen, he came, amen, he is a man of contradictions. Because he didn't come in, in the way that they had expected him to come. Most of us would have been like, Jesus, where's your horse, man? You know what I'm saying? But here he's coming in, in, in humility, riding on a donkey. So what was his proclamation? So as he is a man of peace, approaching the city of peace, and he's coming to bring lasting peace, what is Jesus proclaiming? Well, this was the only time, I want you to get this, in Jesus' ministry that he planned and promoted a public demonstration. This was the only time. Remember all of the other times he told his disciples and, and others not to mention what he did or, or who he was, right? This is also the only time Jesus rode on an animal. All the other times Jesus is walking all over Israel for the next three and a half years he's been walking. This is the first time he gets on an animal. Everywhere he went, he was going by foot or by boat, now the time was over for him to, to reveal who he was. Now is the time of, of, of his revelation of who he is. Jesus was proclaiming himself king, and guess what? He was forcing a response. He was saying, listen, I am the king. I am the awaited Messiah. And so the leaders had to notice and people had to respond. The people had to notice and they had to respond. The disciples had to notice and they had to respond. And we today have to notice and guess what? We have to respond. Is Jesus king or is he not? <laughs> who is this? Somebody say, who is this? Come on, somebody say it again. Who is this? Well, we, we move on in the narrative in verse 8. Let's look at the scene, all right? It says this. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Who were these people? This crowd understood that Jesus was the Messiah. What they did not understand was that it wasn't time for him to set up his kingdom yet. 
And Jesus, listen, he tried to tell these people, listen, come on, I, I haven't come to set up a kingdom that you think. Even he had to, you know, he had to tell a few people that, no, I'm, I'm not coming for what you think I'm coming for right now. And so Matthew often refers to the crowds that were found around Jesus. If you read through the book of Matthew, you see that he refers to crowds. And frequently he uses that term crowds. But on this occasion, guess what he says? He has a different expression. He says a great crowd, a large crowd. He uses it nowhere else. It was a crowd of Israelites getting ready for Passover, which could have been around 2 million people in the city of Jerusalem. Yeah, we know he fed the crowd of the 5,000, 4,000. Those are just men. So, yeah, those are 10,000 maybe people. But here you have upwards to a million to 2 million people now in the city because of Passover. It was a very large crowd. Matthew wants us to realize that this was an impressive event, not a passing recognition by just a few people. And in spreading their cloaks on the road, the people were giving Jesus the royal treatment. Have anybody ever been on a red carpet event? Well, you've seen it on TV, right? Yeah, that means you get the royal treatment. Well, that's what it means when they were spreading their cloaks on the road. Uh, They were giving Jesus the royal treatment, the improvised, what we call red carpet. We see also in 2 Kings 9 and 13 where people did the same thing with garments. So what they were saying that this marked his arrival, this marked an arrival of a great dignitary. Jesus was openly declaring to the people that he was their king and the Messiah that they had been waiting for. You remember the messianic expectation. It starts way back with Abraham. (laughs) Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and he was glad. So messianic expectation has been around for a very, very long time. And Jesus is now declaring that your Messiah is here. Verse 8, a very large cloud spread their cloaks on the road while others, what, cut branches from trees and spread them on the ground. So we talked about the cloaks. We talked about the red carpet treatment. But what did the palms represent? Well, victory is represented by the palm branch. Somebody say victory. Come on, victory. There's a, there's a song you used to sing growing up in church. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. I told Satan, not your mother-in-law, get thee behind. Victory today is mine. That's the song we used to sing. You know, my mom used to be a worship quote-unquote leader back in the day. I love those kind of victory songs. And so here we see as people are putting the the palms on the road and cutting down palm branches, victory is represented by the palm branch. And those people in this story, in this account, use palm branches to celebrate Jesus' arrival. This certain act has a rich cultural and historical background for the Jews. The palm tree is an important symbol of victory for Israel after God delivered them from slavery in Egypt. Right now, Passover is the 15th day of of Nisan on the Hebrew calendar. Today begins their Passover celebration. And so the palm branch represented their victory, God leading them out from Egypt. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so what did it do? What did the Lord do? After they left Egypt, the Lord commanded that they celebrate a feast in honor of their freedom. In honor of the freedom they had from their hands of Pharaoh, their captors, who enslaved them for hundreds of years. Listen, this feast that God told the Israelites to do is known as the Feast of Tabernacles which takes place for seven days. And so what happens during the Feast of Tabernacles is the Jews dwell in booths made of what? Palm branches. Palm branches. So the palm branch marked a triumph for the people of Israel on their day. Their king now, Jesus, had arrived. And in their minds, what? He was going to deliver them from Roman 
occupation. It was a victory parade. It was a parade, y'all, like no other. It was better than the Super Bowl parade. Come on. It was better than any parade you might have ever did. This is, this is millions of people. They're, 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 they're laying their cloaks. They're cutting down palm branches. They're crying out. What, what did they cry out in verse 9? It says the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed him. What did they shout? Hosanna! See, some of y'all are a little too quiet for me when you come to church. I, I, I like some loud folks giving God some loud praise. Come on, because the devil is sure shouting right now in the streets. Come on, I want to get louder, amen, than the enemy, somebody. And he said, what do they say? Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes, what? In the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Y'all helping me preach right now. So what was the praise? What was this praise they were given? Well, Hosanna, as Pastor Luke already alluded to, Hosanna is this Hebrew expression meaning to help us or to save us. It was developed, it was a developed into an expression of praise in Jewish worship. It was an exclamation or an exclamation of praise implying this. Get this. It was implying rulership. And as they were praising, they included the words, the son of David, which was a messianic title for the conquering Messiah. Now, I want to give you a little bit of insight, and I've shared it before, but, but in the terms of, of, of some of the Jewish writings and, and the teachers and the rabbis, over the centuries, they developed a, a, a Messiah, a two Messiah understanding because one Messiah was Messiah uh, ben Yosef, the son of Yosef, the son of Joseph. The other concept of Messiah was Messiah uh, ben David, the son of David. And so the, the suffering Messiah is the suffering uh, Messiah is the son of Joseph Messiah. Because Joseph had to suffer, and he was thrown in a pit, and he was thrown in prison. So, so they had this concept that a Messiah was to come and suffer. But then they also had this concept that there would be a conquering Messiah to come. But what they didn't get was that Jesus is both Messiahs. And so they proclaim, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They understood that Jesus was declaring himself to be their Messiah. And these praises, these shouts reflect what we read in Psalm 118, verse 25 and 26. And in that psalm, it says, Lord, what? Save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless. That's what they were talking about. How many know that Jesus wants to bless us, amen? Jesus wants to grant us kingdom success, amen? Jesus, who has come in the name of the Lord, guess what? He's come to save us. Hosanna. So we continue reading, and so we hear, we see in verse 10, it says, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, what? Who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, I'm going to show you a few things here for a moment. They asked the question, who is this? Now, when, when, the, when the Magi came looking for the king of the Jews as a baby, all Jerusalem, Matthew 2 and 3, it says all Jerusalem was troubled. Now when the king is, is arriving as a, an adult, all the city, the city is literally stirred. That word there in the Greek means shaken. That's where we get our word a seismic from. This was a seismic event. All of Jerusalem was stirred up. It was probably a stirring of enthusiasm for some and apprehension for others. Did you get that? Not everybody was stirred because of the same understanding that they had. 
Some were afraid of Jesus. Others were loving and welcoming of Christ. So there, there was a stirring going on in the city. And indeed, the impression is that the people of the city of Jerusalem did not know what to make of Jesus' dramatic arrival. And it was the Galilean pilgrims accompanying Jesus who had to enlighten them. You men, you got to understand that even in Israel itself, you had a lot of different uh, political things going on, religious, uh, uh, different religious uh, groups going on, the Essenes, the Zealots, the, the, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. Then you had your differences in the people who lived in Jerusalem versus those who lived in Galilee. Galilee was a place that was understood to be people who were spiritually on fire for God. (laughs) It was the Galileans who really embraced Jesus, not those folks in Jerusalem. So here as Jesus is coming, remember, it is the Passover. So all of these people from Galilee, amen, they're they're, they're trying to help these folks realize this is Jesus the Messiah. And so what do they say? They say that this is Jesus the prophet, what, from Nazareth of Galilee. The words, the prophet from Nazareth, it sounds kind of anticlimactic. After hearing the words, Hosanna, the son of David. For for in the crowds, remember Nathaniel, when when Jesus was picking his disciples, he he chose Nathaniel. And you all recall that. What did Nathaniel say? He said, Can anything good what? Come out of Nazareth. Wow. Sometimes I have to remind myself, I'm from Reno, Nevada. I have to say, Can anything good come out of a gambling, smoking, high suicide, drinking city? Yes, God called me from Reno. Can anything good come out of that city in Oregon where the Cookmans are from? Oh, yes, the Cookmans are good people. Amen. Can anything good come out of the Georgia peaches in Atlanta? Come on, some Atlanta Georgia peaches. Yes. (laughs) God will bring the best out of some of these places. And Nazareth was known as just this rundown kind of this ghetto city in Jerusalem. And so they're saying he is a prophet from the ghetto. Uh Uh-oh, y'all didn't get that right. He's the prophet from the ghetto. He's the prophet from Nazareth. And and so Jesus is coming, and, and they're saying he's not only Hosanna, but they're saying he is this prophet. Who is this? Well, he is the true king. He is the true Lord. And we have to all answer that question today. Who is this? Are we going to believe it? Are we going to, uh, when we're faced with the question, who is this? Are we going to be like John the Baptist who said, is this the one or should we look for another? When we are asked the question, who is this? Are we going to be like the high priest who would later say, are you the Messiah of God? Come on, you remember that. After this, there was the high priest who was asking who is what. And then are we going to be like Pilate who would later ask this question, are you the king of the Jews? You see, there's going to always be doubters. So when you're confronted by modern day culture and they ask, who is Jesus? What is going to be your answer? Are you going to say that he was born of a virgin, that he was a miracle man, that he was without sin? Are you going to say that he is the son of God, the king of kings, the lamb of God, the Lord of lords, the lion of the tribe of Judah? Are you going to say he's alpha and omega, the beginning and the end? He's the branch and the bread of heaven. Come on, are you going to say he's the cornerstone and the capstone? He's my deliverer. He's Emmanuel. Are you going to say he's the holy one of Israel? He's the highest. Come on. He is my friend. Are you going to say it? He is the redeemer and the savior of all men. Who is this? I don't know about you, but I'm going to say it. In the face of all of the things that are going on here in America, I've got to stand for Jesus. I've got to proclaim that he is king over my life. Hallelujah. And listen, saints of God, we can't back down. 
We can't go run away and try to crawl into our hole, our little Christian hole. No, we got to come out, amen, with some love. We got to come out with some truth. We've got to come out with some declaration and proclamation of who Jesus is. Because at the end of the day, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Are you willing to die for him? Are you willing to give everything up for him? Are you willing to go wherever he tells you to go? That's who Jesus is. And in my conclusion, listen. Jesus, the prophecies from Scripture, he not only fulfilled those, but, but again, after this event, and we'll talk about it next week, but, but he, he went to the cross for us. And, and, and so people throughout history, they, they, they misunderstood the mission of the Messiah. The most learned, the most educated, even the people of just commonality in Israel, they missed this moment. The Jews thought that the Messiah again would come and overthrow the Roman government that was oppressing them. And they thought that Jesus would immediately set up his kingdom on earth. That is why Judas flipped the script. Judas thought that Jesus was going to come and set up his kingdom. And Judas, who was a thief anyway, was going to get paid one day. But when Judas realized that that's not what Jesus was going to do, that's when the script flipped in his life. How many have ever had a disappointing, uh, disappointing moment in your life before? Don't allow those moments of disappointment to allow the enemy to come in. That's what happened to Judas. He didn't understand. So he allowed the enemy to get the best of him. Listen, you're not always going to understand why God is doing what he is doing. But you've got to trust him. You've got to love him. You've got to be obedient to him. Amen? So they didn't understand that the Messiah came the first time to die for sinners. Even as the coatless multitudes waved the palm branches and shouted for joy, they missed the true reason for Jesus' coming and Jesus' presence. They could neither see nor understand the suffering Messiah. The one that came riding humbly. Now listen, I forgot to tell y'all. Guess what? He's not coming on a donkey the second time. Oh, hallelujah. Ooh, that's another sermon. He's coming on a horse, y'all. Victory. He's coming to throw some devils in hell. Come on. I, I told Jesus I want to be right there. When you kick the Antichrist, when you kick Satan, the false prophet, I just want to be there. I don't know if he's going to grant me that or not, but that's my prayer. He's coming to kick some abute. That's as nice as I can sound. We serve the man. <laughs> Woo, he's coming on a horse. But back to what this multitude, they miss that he was going to come and have to suffer and die on the cross. And it, it is a tragic thing, right, to see the Savior but not really recognize who he is. The crowds were crying Hosanna on Palm Sunday, but then they were crying crucify him later in the week. There is a coming day, there's coming a day when, when a great multitude, amen, from every nation wearing white robes and holding palm branches will shout, salvation belongs to our God. Amen. That day is yet to come because this crowd didn't understand it then. But if you turn to Revelation, the seventh chapter and nine verses 10, it says this. After this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one can count. You talk about a large crowd. I'm on somebody. And this crowd was just not pilgrims uh, from, from Israel. This crowd is from every nation. Hallelujah. 
This crowd includes you. This cloud includes me. And Revelation says, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches in their hand. And guess what? They cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Hallelujah. That day is coming. Are you going to hang in there? When they start to ask you, who is this? Come on, are you going to tell them? Come on, Sister Joanne, are you going to tell them? Are you going to share your testimony? Dixie, are you going to tell them who he is? Come on, somebody. Woo. Who is this? We need to let our world know who Jesus is. Not our political affiliation, not our philosophical ideals, amen, not, come on, we got to tell them who Jesus is. Not how much money you have or don't have, tell them who Jesus is. It don't matter how many hairs of your head that he can count or can't count, it, tell them who Jesus is. Come on, are you ready? Come on, let's stand. Come on, let's stand. Hallelujah. God, we thank you for blessing us. We are crying Hosanna today because, Lord, we know that salvation is from you. In the Lamb. Who is this? It is Jesus, the Son of God. We believe. We believe. And so, Lord, my prayer today for my brothers and my sisters who are, who are followers of Christ is that they will be able to answer that question in the face of persecution. Even the basketball team, Or Roberts, had, had many haters and, and people writing on, on blogs and things and news uh, uh, companies saying that Or Roberts should be ejected from the tournament because they're Christians. And they don't believe in the LGBTQ plus and they don't believe in all of the things that are going on. They should be uh, eliminated from the, tur the tournament. Well, where is our voice in this country? Last time I checked, America was the land of the free. No, we know the truth. We know that there's an, an, the, the devil is behind all of this stuff in our culture. But, God, we are going to declare truth in love. Hallelujah. We're going to declare to the broken and the down and out, the abused and misused. Listen, this is who Jesus is. You don't have to stay in your sin. You can be healed. You can be set free from addictions. You can be set free from sexual immorality. You can be set free from pornography. You can be set free from alcohol. You can be set free from anger and bitterness and hatred and racism. You can be set free because this is who Jesus is. He came to bring us freedom. Hallelujah. Praise God. Lord, we thank you again for this day. And, Lord, we're going to go forth in victory as your sons and your daughters. And I thank you for Live Free Church. I thank you, Lord, that we are a community of brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, Lord, who worship you with passionate expression. We share the good news of Jesus with others. We connect with other believers in meaningful relationships. We empower leaders to fulfill their God-given destiny. We prepare disciples to impact present-day future. Amen. And, and present day culture. I'm sorry. I said future, but culture. And so, God, we thank you, Lord, for Live Free Church. And we are empowering people to live a life of freedom through Jesus Christ. And as we go forth in our week, may we be the people you've called us to be, answering the question, who is this? God bless you. I love you, family. See you next week for Resurrection Easter Sunday. God bless. We hope you enjoyed today's message and pray that you experience the freedom God has for you through His Son, Jesus Christ. John chapter 8, verse 36 says, If the Son gives you freedom, you are free. If you would like more information about Live Free Church, please visit us on the web at www.livefreechurch.org.